Good morning, good morning. How are you? A lovely autumnal morning. Got a, it's Friday and I only work uh, in the morning on Fridays. We've had We've had uh, Tuesday and Thursday off as well this week. So in fact, I've only worked Monday, Wednesday, and I'll be working this morning. So it's been a very quiet week. First week in September. Oh, look, they cut the grass there. Very nice. Some they couldn't have cut it all the way back to the hedge, but. Anyway, I hope you're well. The old sunflowers are a bit, gone over a bit, haven't they, on the left there? Still looking nice though. The old uh, farmer, I think he's cut all the ones in the middle and just left this little strip down the border so they still look nice from the road. They do that sometimes. There they are. Look. Sometimes they plant uh, poppies as well along the borders. So, what have I got today? I've got a bloke coming in. He's a lovely bloke, he's a firefighter, but uh, he had a bang on his front tooth, which killed it, and then somebody else has um, had a go at apersecting it, and it hasn't worked, and so he's got root resorption. So I did him, and he needed a post crown, so I've done him a post crown, but the post crown's got loose, so, which is a rare thing for me, for any of my crown and bridge work to fail, so, it's a special case really um, we did a we, we re-root treated it I didn't want to re it we re-root treated it obviously had a very very wide um, apex and uh, the fact that the tooth come out means one or two could mean one of three things one it could mean that the roots split in half broken vertically but we don't think that's the case the other thing is that it uh, could mean that the tooth's infected which means that uh, the acidic pus is uh, dissolving the um, the glue and uh, that's causing the tooth to come out or it could be that it's overloaded in which case uh, and I think it's the overloading because he's a guy who's got a uh, mouth breathing gear on pretty much every day and uh, of course that you know it's going to put a lot of strain on his teeth so, so fortunately the tooth is a bit wobbly, so we're taking it out. We're going to make a temporary, take it out, and then uh, see if we can't just do the longest post ever, up to within a couple of mil of this uh, root treated tooth. And then uh, remake the crown and then see, see how it goes. Because the alternative is honestly is, uh, you know, not good implant, probably not not that brilliant, um, you know, bridge work, you know, is it going to survive any more than the crown? So we'll see how it goes, not to mention the expense. So that's my big job this morning. Problem with uh, something like that is you don't know how much it's going to cost. We're going to possibly take the uh, well, we'll take the crown off and then send it off to the lab with the post inside it and ask them if they can they can drill it out, you know. And then I'll try and retrofit the post to the old crown. If not, they'll have to make a new crown. That's why I can't really tell him how much it's going to cost because I'm what I'm doing is I'm trying to save him money. I could say to him, no, we just need to pay for a new post crown. Um, I wouldn't really have too much uh, uh, regret in doing that because. You know, it's well, the, the trouble is that when a patient's got a problem like that, then you tend to adopt it and sort of think of it as your problem, whereas it's not. It's not really your problem. They've got problematic teeth. That's their their teeth are their problem. They come to you for solutions, and if they need a, you know, if you do a crown and and it fails because of their problematic teeth. Uh, then uh, you shouldn't feel too bad if you do a crown and it fails and then you do another 30 crowns and they all fail then you've got to start thinking that 
possibly there's another factor. Yeah, yeah that's right. Just use, just put your wheels over the white line. We don't care. So anyway, hopefully I'll uh, be able to do it for him for not much over the cost of a new post and crown, uh, post and core. But if we do need a new crown, I will have to tell him that. Well, I'll give the lad the discretion. That's how I can't. I can't say to him how much in advance. So he's paid half the cost of a new crown up front, and I'll explain to him that we'll just have to adjust it. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to do what's fair to you and to the patient. He's worried that he's getting charged twice for everything, I suppose. Um, we are uh, about 30% down on last year in terms of revenue since January the 1st. We've got this, all our payments go through a credit card system. And so we can get quite easy reports, you know. I suppose technically we should have done from 1st of October last year to 30th of September this year. Although we haven't actually finished the year yet. But the quick report I ran yesterday was 1st of January to yesterday, 12th of Thursday the 12th of Sep. And it shows we're 30% down. So it's always, I mean, it's amazing to me that I'm a 30% down and actually I'm not that bothered because at the end of the day, you know, if you're a general dental practitioner, as long as you've got enough money to pay the staff and the rent at the, rest, at the end of the week, and the suppliers at some point after that, um, then then you tend to assume that you're okay. But um, but being thirty percent down is not good. But then, you know, I'm going to work on the basis that I'm going to assume that we're probably going to. Yeah, I should go to wait it. Sorry about that, I had to worry about the safety of that woman on the bike. Yeah, so 30% down. So, you know, first of all, that's not the full year figures. So I don't know, you know, it's only the year to uh, middle of September figures. And to be honest, we have just had two weeks off. So, uh, but we had a very quiet uh, April, May, June, July. Uh, and it's always tempting to sort of try and worry about what what's going wrong, you know. Uh, why uh, things are going, you know, are the patients all leaving for somewhere else, blah, blah, blah. My um, experience, my 45 years worth of experience in general practice tells me that the problem is economic. It's that nobody has any money. Literally nobody has any money. It's, uh, we've had a general election, we've had a party, you know, we had a choice between a party which what was demonstrated to me incompetent and, a, and, an, and the alternative was a party which we know to be incompetent. So, so not surprising, you know, we decided to give the old Tories uh, five years on the naughty step to see if they can up their game. But that, we're well. We're still well early into that. In the meantime, of course, um, you know we've got this staff situation where they're raising interest rates to try and keep inflation under control, and uh, they've clubbed consumer demand like a baby seal um, in order to help in that. And uh, as a result, nobody's going to be doing anything until interest rates start coming down again. Uh, which might be sooner than you think. I think I uh, haven't got the election over and done with. And the Americans, uh, the European Central Bank has certainly started reducing interest rates. And I think then what will happen is the Bank of England and the uh, Federal Reserve will, will probably uh, start pretty soon. But I don't think the Federal Reserve will start until after the election. Oh, for goodness sake. Uh, 
That should have been me. So yeah, so I don't think the Federal Reserve is going to um, decrease rates until after the election. And that's not until November the 5th, so we're looking at, uh, you know, but, you know still, still a few months to go before that. Or the, uh, the smart thinking is that they'll, they'll decrease rates at the very last meeting before the election, because they tend to be more sort of left-leaning and uh, more disposed to keeping the Democrats in power. And so uh, they're going to, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the dawn, the green shoots of recovery are going to be discovered, I think, just before people go out and vote by the Federal Reserve. Junction of death. Not so bad in the summer because it's not icy. But yeah, well, sorry about that. You're a bit annoyed, I know. Anyway, where were we? So yeah, thirty percent down due to economic factors. And that is, you know, you, you should know from the people who are around you, perhaps even your own family, you know, they're getting, uh, uh, you know, they're having trouble paying for a holiday if they can go on holiday. And then the dishwasher packs up and they, so they've got to find another three, four hundred pounds for a new dishwasher. I mean, I know dishwasher is not, uh, dishwasher is not you know, I mean, you can wash dishes, can't you, without a dishwasher, let's face it. But, but my general point is that people have just got no money. You know, they've got, they're pretty well maxed out their credit cards, as they have in the States. And uh, this idea that they've got discretionary spending. Now, where does dentistry fit in with discretionary spending? You know, the dentist, dentistry is, in a way, is sort of both. It's... Uh, emergency insofar as if you've got toothache or your front crown falls out or something then it's something that you have to fit in your budget of stuff that has to be paid for even if it goes on your credit card the uh, the other stuff like uh, perhaps taking and getting a route taken out that has uh, been in there for a few years or uh, a tooth root treated that's got a gun boil on it or you know some decay that's uh, in the early stages and not giving you toothache that's you know, it's getting deferred that gets deferred when money's tight but then but then people eventually uh, either get toothache or they come in and, and say I'm gonna get my teeth you know the rest of my treatment planned up we've got some quite interesting uh, information now of our point of sale system, it's called Square. Um, I think the uh, average spend is about 300 quid on our treatment, which is, you know, I don't know how useful that is because what you really want is the median spend. You don't want the average spend. The average spend is, is just what happens is you put everything in and divide it by the number of patients. And that can be skewed by one or two um, outliers. So uh, I'll give you an example. Supposing somebody asked me to um, plant four trees for them and every year they ring me up and they say how are my trees doing? Are they are they growing well? You know are they are they uh, shooting up? And what happens is that I go out let's say in year 10 and I find that one of the trees is 97 feet tall. And I find that the other three are one foot tall. So clearly one of them is really racing away. And the other three are pretty well dead. So I say to the folk, 
on average they're 25 feet tall <laughs> which is 97 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 divided by 4 so 25 feet tall on average and he's going oh that's all right then oh he doesn't know that three of them are nearly dead <laughs> so but if he'd said what is the median height of the trees in other words what is the most commonly occurring height <laughs> what height would I expect most of them to be at if I went and had a look I'd have to say well the median height of the trees is one foot I'm afraid because uh, well, they've been skewed by this one that's grown shot away to 97 feet and uh, so that's why I might have to do a little bit more digging into uh, the spend you know but we had a, a solicitor when I was working for the DPA, we had a very good solicitor in London. And uh, when you go to a London solicitor, you're always worried about the cost. And I always remember something they said to me. He said, look, I know, I know for a fact you're going to be say you're worried about the cost. He said, let me tell you how, how the fees, let's put it on the table right at the beginning. This is how we work. He said, we get, uh, we want about a thousand pounds off of every client. He said, that's, that's all we want. Don't want 10,000 or 100,000. We want about 1,000 pounds off of every client for the, for the service that we provide. And then what we do is that we then aim to have about 300 clients in a year. So there's 200 working days in a year. So you can easily see that they could probably service 300 clients in a year in the same way as you and I could, could service 300 patients in a year. It would be easy to do. Um, and if you multiply 300 by 1,000, you get 300,000. And he said for the average solicitor here, he said 300,000 pound a year in, in fees is, is, a, is a result, it's good, you know. So he said, as long as you're thinking along the lines of about 1,000 pounds, you and me are gonna get on great. And I thought, well, if you and me are thinking about 1,000 pounds, you and me are gonna get on great because that's affordable, you know, we can do that. And so that's the way I look at it, really, with dentistry. My receptionist, who's joined us from another practice, which was very busy and, you know, one of those places where they haven't got an appointment for three months. Five dentists working like, like ridiculously hard. She's, I can see the worry in her eyes. She's worried mainly that our, our uh, what's the word, our occupancy rate, you know, our, our, our working, she can't see how we can support the surgery working two and a half days a week, <laughs> two days, two days at home, you know, answering the phone remotely and getting a suntan. And I can see in her eyes, she's a little bit, you know, it's a very, very strange way of working for her. So I had to take her aside and say, look, the success of the surgery is not, is not the number of fillings it does. It certainly shouldn't be the number of fillings it does. It's not the number of patients it sees. It's not far how far ahead it's booked. <coughs> it's not how late it runs. It's basically done on a simple, is it profitable? Have we got 300 patients paying us on the median, in the median, a thousand pounds a year? And I think we probably do. Well, I think we probably could. I know we, we obviously don't at the moment. I think, obviously, we don't at the moment. I'll take that back. But that's what I'm going to try and work towards. It's just a question of how do you get 300 patients paying you a £1,000 a year? And it's, uh, you know, you'd have to invent something completely new. You'd have to invent DAAS, Dentistry as a Service. And, and you'd have to come up with a scheme or modify your existing DPAS or DEMPLAN scheme to say we've only got one rate or three rates, but ideally one rate and it's a thousand pound a year and we're just looking to take on 300 patients who, you know, who can pay that. Now the problem is that, you know, with, with the law, I mean, I know lots of people pay a thousand pounds to a lawyer as a retainer. Uh, you could do it that way, but 
obviously their thousand pounds they get includes quite a few new patients and, and other people whose legal problem has to be solved and is not going to recur um, will leave. So their thousand pounds is coming to a certain extent from one-off cases and not necessarily from retainers. So it's a slightly different model. But that's, uh, yeah, hello. Looks like, looks like ancient Egypt over there with all those flat top pyramids. Anyway, I don't want to ramble, but that's the whole point. You know, I'm just trying to think out loud how we could get to that stage where we've got 300 patients paying a thousand pound a year each. But no, I think at the moment, you know, it's always, it's traditional, isn't it? Everybody gets together. How are you doing? How are you doing? Or, oh, I'm quiet. Are you quiet? They're like, they don't want to say that they're quiet. But if they think that they might be able to get you to say that you're quiet, they'll say that they're quiet. Hoping that you'll say, oh yeah, that's right, I'm quiet as well. But, um, my objective is not really to... You know, you just have to, uh, you just have to roll with it, you know. When things are quiet, then you take advantage of that to do stuff like inspection, testing, compliance. When, uh, you know, painting the surgery, if you like. Heart training. And then when things are busy, then it's all hands to the pumps. And it all balances out. Take it from me over 45 years. Everything sorts itself out in the end. As long as you don't take on too much debt. And you know, you keep it real. Keep, don't sort of, you know, go over the board with anything. What do I mean by that? I mean, I know we've got we've got all the you know we buy all the masks and the gloves and stuff like that and everything. But then we were never the first to get a what a disinfector or anything. Uh, we've got a nice steriliser. Um, but we don't uh, we don't go out of our way to sort of show how good we are. How you know when they say oh well, you know the HTM thing was had two standards didn't it? it had required standard and a ideal standard and a lot of dentists went out of their way to demonstrate that they had achieved the higher ideal standard well we didn't we were always saying well what's what's the minimum standard and that's what we'll achieve so as a result i mean we've never really well I mean, we've never had an overdraft it's coming up for 10 years now we've never had an overdraft we got bloody close to having no money in the bank, but we've never had an overdraft. I suppose you could say that in the early years when we probably would have liked an overdraft, I lent the surgery some money and then now the surgery's paying me back. And uh, you don't want to make a profit, you know, as long as your cash flow is okay, let the profit worry about itself. All right, lovely. Sorry about that. I've got a bit rambling towards the end there, but um, got a little bit of useful clinical advice, hopefully. I'll um, talk to you soon. Bye.